Today on Folks, we'll explore some of the problems of teen parents and show you how some community programs are helping young mothers cope. We'll also take a brief look at the life and career of Jacob Lawrence, an American painter. Welcome to another edition of Folks. I'm Sonia Massengale. The feminization of poverty is a new way of describing an old problem. Regardless of race, young mothers under the age of 25 are very likely to be poor, stay poor and single, and raise children who are just as likely to repeat the cycle of teen pregnancy and poverty. Their only hope is in becoming economically independent. The Teen Parent Center is a place for those young mothers who want to help themselves. They can prepare for their high school equivalency exam and get help finding jobs. We spoke to three young mothers there about some of the problems they face raising their children. Well, I had to get up late at night and take her to the doctor when she was sick. And I had to sit out of the airplane for about six hours, waiting and waiting. He never called us, so I had to leave and come back home. So I went back out there that morning. They went on and they saw Cause see, she couldn't really breathe. You know, she had a breathing problem. And the doctor told me that she had adenoids. And then he gave me the prescription. And her medicine was high, high. So my grandmother went on and got it because I didn't have the money. So she got it for me. I haven't had any problems so far except when I need to buy her pampers and things. I don't have the money to. And I have to get it from my sister, um, my mom. He I've never seen her. I was worried about it at first, but then I got me a job, so I'm not worried about it. But I'm worried about her growing up asking me who her daddy is. Does he know about her? Mm-hmm. He denies her. Continuing education is only one part of the program at the Teen Parent Center. They are attempting to better the lives of these young women by making them better parents and increasing their ability to find jobs. We have both group individual and group counseling sessions, as well as a new program that we're about to start, which is called Work Experience. And that ties very closely to the, to the employment prep. What we attempt to do there is after a young girl has gone through the program, and she's at a point where we feel has made some decisions and is ready to try out employment, through our Work Experience program, we're able to place them on a job for six to eight weeks. And all we're attempting to do there is to expose them to the world of work. Do you find yourself handicapped at all by not being able to discuss abortions as an alternative? We are funded under Title 20 legislation, and that legislation primarily or specifically says that we will do no abortion counseling, no referral. Okay. The other thing is we'd like young women, to, young women to look at the other options that are available to them. If you look at the national trend, more young women are opting to keep their children as opposed to surrendering for adoption. And a lot of it is because they don't see that as a viable option for them. And so we want to expose them to those options that are also available. State officials around the country have determined that welfare programs fail to provide solutions to the problem of teenage pregnancy. This was an issue at the National Council of State Legislatures meeting in New Orleans. It's been found through a lot of different analyses yeah, in, that have been recently done that the teens who become pregnant are also teens for whom self-sufficiency would be a substantial problem even if they weren't pregnant. So that there are already a set of characteristics, if you like, um, that mean the teens need particular help even if it it hasn't led to pregnancy for them. So in essence, we're saying that teen pregnancy is very costly in both financial and human terms. Uh, and there is no quick and easy solution to it. You can't just 
say, let's delay the birth a few years and then the problem will go away. It certainly won't. It is possible that the Roe versus Wade decision may be modified or it may be reversed. However, whatever happens in that regard, I believe that a far more logical and constructive approach to the issue of unwanted pregnancies is the one used in Wisconsin. What Wisconsin concentrated on was elimin eliminating the need or the perceived need for abortions and emphasizing the alternative of pregnancy prevention. After all, the best way to avoid abortion ever becoming an issue is very simple. You just don't get pregnant. That should be simple. State Representative Jewel Newman feels that the answer lies in education and feels that churches must play a key role in this. Churches have a responsibility they have to play because how you look at it, churches have a responsibility to the community. At one time we could look at the federal government to do it, but the money isn't there. We can't go to the state in the long run. So it's up to us as individuals that teachers, people can understand to get to these kids and tell them. Uh, the medical profession has been working very good with us. It's, there's no excuse that uh, these kids should get pregnant now. I think they need the proper guidance and we can stop it. Teenagers will get pregnant and the pregnancy rate is increasing in Louisiana. Will the church be enough? Well, you know, when you start dealing with public policy, you got uh, chase groups that are uh, against abortion that you have to, to live with. And that's their belief. And uh, in the meantime, we have to look out for these girls that uh, continue to get pregnant. And it's going to take an education process. And through education, you can solve any problem you have. If it, it's through education. And what I, I know is a, it's a process that we have to use. We've got to educate our kids and get forums going that they can come out and hear the right type of talk. And regardless of where their goal has someone be to talk this stuff to them. Because if you talk it long enough, you finally catch on to them. Our studio guests today are Ms. Lynn Covington, who is a social worker at the Teen Parent Center in Baton Rouge, and Mrs. Etta Millinder, Director of Youth at the Greater New Galilee Baptist Church in Baton Rouge. So tell me, Ms. Covington, do you agree with Representative Newman is about the church's involvement with uh, teenagers in preventing pregnancy and making them better parents? I certainly do. Churches and other community resources, the schools also. Mrs. Millinder, uh, you certainly agree because of your program. Could you tell us something about the youth program at the church? Yes. Our youth department is in action. We at the Greater New Galilee Baptist Church, quite proud of our youth department. We help youths to develop a positive self-esteem. We help them to set goals so that uh, teenage pregnancy can be combated. I see. And what kind of success are you having with this in your church? We are having fantastic response from the youth. Uh, the rate is 99.9% .9 of the youth at our church. There has only been one known pregnancy since we have formed the youth group. How, how long has it been in operation? It has been in operation since going into its second year. And as I said, we have been very, very active. Well, what are you telling the girls and the boys about preventing pregnancy? In telling them, we have certain ways in which to reach them. Number one, we have our youth meetings, our regular youth meetings. Then we have lock-ins. Lock-in is where the youths are staying overnight. At the lock-ins, we have speakers. We have uh, someone from the Teen Parenting Center to come out and show films on teenage pregnancies, how to avoid teenage pregnancies. We have speakers from the Sheriff's Department, the District Attorney's Office. We have um, different ones to come out and share with us on how not to, on how to say no and mean it. We have uh, classes on sex and dating. We have classes on anything a youth might want to know 
about sex. We had someone available for them to talk to 24 hours a day. I find that if a youth had someone to talk to at the particular time that they need it, then they're more apt to say no. I see. And what if someone involved with your program does become pregnant anyway? How would you react or what would you do? With as a love. We want them to know that, number one, your body is a temple and you're to keep it holy. We want them to know what the Bible says. We want them to be knowledgeable of the fact that Satan is going to try to deceive them and going to tell them, hey, this is right. But once we get them in the knowledge of knowing what the Lord says, what the Bible says, and they actually knows it for themselves, we want them to know that they are somebody. And when they know that they are somebody and they feel it, then they're not going to want to do anything that's going to harm them. So the youths are active, as I said. We get great response from them. We have rap sessions. The rap sessions are geared to questions that they may want to ask. Boys may be having problems with girls as well as girls having problems with boys. A lot of times I've had kids to come and say, I almost had sex with him because he said he was going to quit me. Well then, there we are to motivate them, to let them know, hey, it's sex love. Okay. Do you love yourself? Ms. Covington, yeah. uh, you're dealing with mostly teenagers who are already either pregnant or parenting. That's right. Are they still active in the church, in their churches? Uh, most of them say that they attend church, but I haven't heard any say they're involved in a program uh, like she's just described. So you think that uh, this program is fairly unique? Yes, I was asking her if there's some way we might use them as a referral source because it it uh, embodies most of the uh, philosophy that we have uh, to raise self-esteem and uh, we find that most of our clients are severely depressed when we get them and we do much of the same things that she uh, does as far as trying to teach them to respect themselves and their bodies and take care of themselves. Well, what particular problems are you running into in, uh, in coaching these teen parents to become better parents? Well, lack of resources, I guess, would be one of the main ones. Family resources, support at home. Um, we can just do so much during a day with them. And uh, if there were more community resources available, it would support what we do. Are you running into, in, into anything new with dealing with the teen parents of the 80s? I think more of them are uh, keeping their babies. They don't consider adoption as an option. And we don't deal with abortion uh, being a state agency. So that is the only alternative we have to offer. Um, is adoption. Mm -hmm. Well, how? Um, Why are these girls keeping their babies? Well, it's a, a family thing. They don't get support for any other alternative at home. Most of them get um, the mothers are saying, you know, that they don't want to give up any child that's kin to them, that they'll keep the child if the daughter wouldn't. So they're not, um, the mothers aren't looking at any other alternatives either. And it just seems, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. If I did, I'd probably be opening new programs right now. Why are so many teenagers disregarding birth control as an option? What are they telling you about that? I had um, a client yesterday say to me, if I had just chosen that as an option, why not? And I said, it appears to be, they can't answer that themselves. They just don't seem to know how to take responsibility for being a sexual person. 
And most of them say that if they had been able to communicate with their parents, particularly their mother, that this might not have happened. But then on the other hand, they'll say that the mother offered to communicate and they say, I wouldn't have dared tell my mother that I was having any kind of sexual encounters. Um, so I really see that there must be a way that they can communicate with some adult somewhere and it probably will have to be offered through the churches or the schools. Ms. Messinger, let me add, when she says that the children cannot relate to their parents, I find that that's very helpful in our youth group. The children may not be able to relate to the parent. There are some parents who are not or who does not know how to show love. Some parents think that love is to give a child all he wants when they are not giving of themselves. And basically, that's what a child wants. They can give them new things. They can, they can go out and let them have their way, but they don't know how to show love. The children cannot relate to them. Where we come in, we, I'll tell the children, listen, you have someone to talk to. They can talk to us in confidence. Nothing will go back to the parents. Then, on the other hand, we can get together with the parents and the children to help bring about a better relationship between parent and child. Ms. Millinder, do you have any sexual, sexually active, uh, or have you had any, any sexually active teenagers in your Yes, group? prior to their being filled with the love and concern that we had before they were really knowledgeable of what love really was. They thought that sex was the thing lots of peer pressure, lots of parental problems added to their sexual life. But now some of these kids, you cannot pay them to have sex. They come and say, well, I almost did it, but I thought about how Satan would be laughing at me. I almost made a mistake, and I thought about what the Bible said. How about parenting teens? Do you have any that are involved in your youth group? And if so, how are they uh, managing their resources. Uh, Ms. Covington mentioned that money is often a problem. How are they handling it? Like I said, we have that one young lady who is a member of our youth department. And the reason she is a member because when she became pregnant, we worked with her and let her know that it was a mistake, but we still loved her and we still love her. She's living with her parents they are supporting the child. The young lady is back in school and we want her to know that we're going to work with her and that we really love her. We don't want her to make the mis a mistake again, nor do we want any of our youths to make mistakes. But we want them to know that if they do, we're going to still love them and we're going to work with them. And the youths themselves are behind the young lady. They are with her, and they're saying, hey, we love you, too. And that means a lot. Ms. Covington, speaking of, uh, of repeat pregnancies, is there any particular trend now towards that uh, with uh, any of the clients that you see? Unfortunately, yes. We're seeing a lot of repeats now. Is, is there a reason for that, I mean, that you can uh, pinpoint? I see the uh, young women as very depressed. They get the uh, uh, birth control from family planning. Uh, that's readily available. Um, then they don't take it. They, they still don't seem to have enough um, concern about their lives or feel like they have enough control over them uh, to take responsibility. It's, it's uh, a very depressed population we work with. And there may be a, a boyfriend that, a new boyfriend comes along and they are afraid they're going to lose him and they choose to get pregnant for him. Well, do teenagers always make problem parents? Is that always the case? No, I wouldn't say that's always the case. Um, we see different parenting styles. Uh, among our clients and many of them parent like their parents did. It's a cycle and 
Some are better than others. Thank you very much. We've been talking with uh, Lynn Covington, who is a social worker at the Teen Parent Center, and Etta Millinder, Director of Youth, Greater New Galilee Baptist Church of Baton Rouge. Now, time for another folks flashback. Everybody's just folks. This is how the Baton Rouge skyline looked a couple of years ago, and this is how it looked in 1960. A clear sign that times have changed, and so have racial attitudes. In 1960, a group of students from Southern University staged protests against segregated city and state laws. Marvin Robinson was Southern student government president at the time and one of the leaders of the protest. He recalled a big rally that took place in March 1960. If you can imagine, March the 30th, if I'm not uh, mistaken, the paper said there were 3,000 black students that marched now you must understand, can you understand the commitment of 3,000 students marching from this point downtown to the state capitol and not one word being said? 3,000 people scared hell out of white folk because there was not one word scared daylights out of me <laughs> because every time we looked up that we were continuously confronted with where are we going next the students definitely had an impact on changing state and local laws because they refused to be refused in 1935 under franklin delano roosevelt's new deal the works progress administration the wpa was founded now the program provided jobs for the needy one person who benefited greatly from the program was Jacob Armstead Lawrence. He is considered to be one of America's best known contemporary painters. Jacob Lawrence grew up in Harlem during the Depression. It was during that time that Lawrence developed his interests in painting. As a result of that depression, the administration at that time, the Roosevelt administration, established art centers throughout the country. And I realized the value of that even more in, in retrospect. Uh, it meant that many of us, uh, I'll say kids of my age, 13, 14, 15, we were able to go into these centers and receive free instruction and guidance into whatever we were interested in. Harlem was a cultural nucleus of the nation. It was a time known as the Harlem Renaissance. Lawrence met many well-known writers and artists from the period people he says influenced and encouraged his painting career. Claude McKay, the writer, Augusta Savage, the sculptor, uh, these were all people in the community. She was a sculptor, of course. Uh, there was Charles Austin, Henry Bannon, um, and, and some people of whom I've forgotten. But I would say there were, there were many people in the, in the community that really uh, helped me, encouraged me, and, and so on. The WPA's federal art project was also instrumental to Lawrence's career. He says to him it was a school in many ways, the interchange with many diverse artists, the opportunity to concentrate on work with all materials provided, and the dignity of having a good job in hard times. Lawrence made his mark in the art world before his 21st birthday. His first major series of paintings, completed in 1938, dealt with Toussaint Louverture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution, a series of paintings that many people said was one of the most important narratives of its time. During that period, uh, we had streetcar, uh, we call them street soapbox speakers, and we also had afternoon uh, clubs, history clubs in school, clubs of various kinds, and through teachers in school and through listening to the various speakers on the street talk about various heroes, uh, black heroes, uh, and one of the people, they, one of the persons they mentioned was uh, Toussaint Louverture, and of course I, I was acquainted, I became acquainted with Toussaint Louverture through many of the black teachers that I had in school. And uh, it was a very dramatic story for me, and uh, I loved the story, as most kids would. 
Uh, it represented a, a symbol of someone who had overthrown oppression. I guess it was a symbol I could relate to and, and associate with, and it was very dramatic. I decided to do that in a series form because I could not tell a story in one painting. You know, that's difficult to do unless you're doing a mural, something of that sort. So that's how that, that developed. It was through the Toussaint Louverture series that Lawrence developed his painting style, expressionistic, the style that he has become famous for. That ex expresses my feelings about content, about subject, and my, some of my first uh, paintings outside of the historical theme were of my experiences within the Harlem community, of my, my visual uh, response to, to things that I would see. And I attempted to put these things down on paper in color, movement, and so on. Lou Stovall is a master printmaker who has long admired Lawrence's works. Stovall says Lawrence's Toussaint Louverture series is ideally suited to translation through the silk screen system, a system that Stovall himself developed. I guess Jake was roughly 20 years my senior. Uh, uh, so I'm the, I would be the, the benefactor of 20 years of his good works. And so I've had 20 years, you know, advantage uh, over his beginning. And so for me to, to come with my, you know, technology and, and sense of, of, the, of the medium, sense of the art and so on, and to do an excellent print for him is an opportunity that's, uh, that's rare and I really appreciate it. Lawrence has received numerous awards and honors throughout his painting career. This year in New Orleans, he was presented the Amistad Research Center's Fine Arts Award. The 69-year-old artist can best be described as a humanist with a moral vision. I, I select the uh, black image because I know that image, but I would like for that to represent uh, uh, mankind in general, this, this, this struggle, this, this, uh, which is very beautiful and, and that people go through. Well, that's all for now. Next week on Folks, we'll take a look at juvenile crime and rehabilitation. Hope you'll be there.